Today at 2.47 a.m., inside the command bunker for the Bryansk Air Defense Network, an operator sipped cold coffee and watched the green sweep of the S-400 radar. 48 hours of no contact had turned into complacency. 78 miles away, that complacency was about to end. Three Storm Shadow cruise missiles were roaring through the night at 600 miles per hour. Each of the Storm Shadows weighed 2,900 pounds. Their escort was not a squadron of fighters. It was 20 FPV drones, cheap, disposable camera crews streaming a 4K ringside seat of the strike. The target, the Bryansk chemical plant. That facility produced roughly 40% of Russia's rocket propellant. It fed K-59 cruise missiles and TUS-1A thermobaric launchers. This was the single node that powered much of a war effort. The operation began with data collection. A Ukrainian recon drone the night before pulled thermal imagery from a commercial satellite feed. It found the telltale one, 800 degree glow of a furnace at peak production. Confirmation arrived, the plant was hot. With confirmation, the command issued the strike order. What followed was a precise asymmetric playbook, a multi-angle swarm mixing small drones, digital deception, and precision munitions to collapse an expensive defense stack. At 2.30 a.m., a modified mini-drone launched from an unmarked truck near Tsunami. Its task was narrow and discreet. Get a live thermal, read on the furnace. It succeeded. The main strike launched from three directions. From the south, two Su-24S released Storm Shadow missiles from close range. From the west, a heavy Akunu drone launched the third missile from about 50 miles out. From the east, 20 low-cost FPV drones streaked in, predictable bait. The Storm Shadows did not fly high. Their Turum navigation scanned terrain in real time, hugging tree lines at 100 to 200 feet. It's the missile equivalent of autonomous vehicle terrain mapping. Constant adjustments to stay under radar horizons. The missiles were the stealthy, high-value element. The FPV swarm was the economic noise. At 2.35 a.m., the S-400 saw a cloud of small targets. It did not detect the high-value missiles hidden beneath the canopy. Targeting was handed off to Panzer S, one-point defense systems. Operators fired a volley of 10 interceptor missiles. It was a textbook result. Five of the $5,000 drones were destroyed. The defenders celebrated. They had shredded cheap bait with expensive interceptors. But the wreckage fell into the Desna River and created plumes of thick smoke. That unintended smokescreen helped mask what was still incoming. Russia scrambled two Su-35S to hunt launch platforms. The fighters climbed. The storm shadows were still miles out. Ukraine amplified the deception. 15 surviving FPV drones activated a Kalman filtering package and began broadcasting manipulated radar signatures. In plain terms, a real-time radar deep fake. A $5,000 drone started to appear on automated threat assessment systems as a $1.5 million cruise missile. Pansir's automatic prioritization flagged them as high-value threats. The defenders now saw 15 inbound cruise missiles and began calculating firing solutions. While Pansir chased ghosts, the real storm shadows crept under the tree line. Turon guidance combined inertial data, terrain mapping, and live corrections. Think of it as combining a self-driving car's route optimization with a Mars rover's ability to read the ground. The missiles stayed hidden. At 2.45 a.m., the Russians hit back with electronic warfare. The Krosokar 4 unleashed a 186-meter-wide jamming storm. GPS links vanished. For most weapons, that would be fatal. The Storm Shadow was not the strongest weapon. It immediately switched to an INS Plus digital scene matching, DSM. If GPS is Google Maps, INS is an internal odometer, and DSM is preloaded street view. The missile snapped a live image, compared it to stored satellite imagery, and corrected its path. Result, sub 10 foot accuracy even without GPS. Pansier crews realized they had been duped and fired again, destroying three more deep fake drones. Su-35 pilots, freed from clutter, finally picked up faint returns on the Su-24S that had launched the missiles. The launch platforms became targets, radar locks broke, confusion spread. At 2.50 a.m., Ukraine played its final costly card. MiG-29 escorts released an ADM-160 MALD, a $300,000 flying supercomputer that perfectly mimics radar signatures. MALD is a digital twin. 
Simultaneously, AGM-88 Harm Anti-Radiation Missiles hunted enemy radar emissions, homing on the sensors themselves. The Su-35 pilot banked hard after what looked like an ideal target. Ground radars suddenly found themselves hunted. Locks broke. The airspace opened. The three storm shadows converged on pre-assigned nodes. The rocket propellant warehouse, the MLRS assembly line, and the furnace itself. At roughly 2.54 a.m., the missiles executed sequenced internal charges. A superheated plasma jet penetrated 20 feet of reinforced concrete. 1.1 seconds later, a main charge detonated within sealed volumes. The effect amplified inside structures. The factory effectively self-destructed. The missile that hit the furnace acted as an ignition source. Propellant stores began to cook off. Approximately 25% of the plant's propellant inventory detonated. Five MLRS assembly lines were obliterated. Heavy tooling became charred wreckage. A toxic chemical plume traveled the Desna River. The strike shut a 50-mile logistics corridor. The FPV drones recorded everything. First confirmation came from orbit, a thermal anomaly registered by commercial satellites. Ground signals followed. Russian telegram channels filled with grainy cell phone videos of a night on fire. Moscow's public response was silence. Denial became impossible. The headline damage estimate from the observable blast and ruined infrastructure was roughly $700 million. That figure captures immediate destruction, ruined stock, and lost production. Strategic damage, however, was the harder currency. Trusted analysis indicated Bryansk's destruction cut roughly 40% of Russia's artillery propellant supply overnight. Thousands of Grad and URG rounds were effectively stranded, intact as metal, but unusable without propellant. Convoys in Kursk and Belgorod stalled. The Desna chemical spill paralyzed the Southern Rail Corridor. Within 72 hours, fuel for K-59 cruise missiles tightened by about 20%. Logistics panic forced redeployments. Analysts suggested Moscow pulled at least two S-400 systems from frontline coverage at Kursk to backfill protection near critical production nodes. Each redeployment created blind spots on the front. Those gaps opened corridors that Ukrainian long-range operators could exploit. Projected near-term equipment losses in exposed sectors rose by about 15%. Psychologically, the strike tore a hole in a core Kremlin narrative. Invincibility at depth. The official line labeled the event a technical incident. Satellite imagery, social video, and failing supply requests told a different story. Frontline commanders who suddenly received error messages instead of ammunition began to question the logistics backbone. A planned Donbass offensive was delayed. Trust eroded. The root causes are layered and instructive. First, modernization mismatch. Systems like the S-400 excel inside particular threat envelopes. They are less effective against distributed, low-signature campaigns that combine physical decoys with digital deception. Second, concentration risk. Centralizing 40% of a critical commodity in a single plant creates a single point of catastrophic failure. Third, information proliferation. Commercial satellites, open imagery, and off-the-shelf software make accurate targeting and spoofing cheaper and faster. Who benefits and who suffers? Ukraine gained time and a new asymmetric lever. Russian tactical units lost ammunition, mobility, and confidence. Third parties felt ripple effects. Global ammunition markets tightened. Neutral states re-evaluated industrial placement and resilience. Exporters of surveillance and anti-spoofing tech saw demand swell. Globally, the incident forced recalculations. NATO analysts re-examined layered air defenses. Procurement officers sought anti-spoof navigation and hardened EW systems. Regional actors weighed dispersal and redundancy. Geopolitically, Moscow faced a binary choice. Harden and disperse production at great expense, or accept vulnerability. What happens next? Expect dispersion, hardening, and redundancy. Moscow will likely decentralize propellant production, add backup rail and river routes, and invest in point defenses and EW resilience. Ukraine will refine the multi-angle swarm, better decoys, more integrated ISR, deeper electronic deception. Probing strikes on secondary nodes are probable. Electronic countermeasure exchanges will intensify. The takeaway is clear. Modern conflict is as much an information and economic contest 
as a kinetic one. A fleet of $5,000 drones can force a defender to burn million-dollar interceptors and expose brittle logistics. Fortresses built around expensive singular technologies can be undermined by clever, low-cost blends of tools. So what is the next critical asymmetric campaign target? Centralized chemical plants, rail choke points, supply depots, and satellite uplinks that feed real-time imagery all qualify. The strategic calculus will shift toward denying logistics as much as seizing terrain. Drop your analysis in the comments. Debate the next likely node. Share this debrief if you value detailed, open source analysis. <laughs> Subscribe to follow the next episode when another fortress gets its bill.